Let's see, I gotta turn this thing on. And on. All right, welcome to our end of the year wrap here at Stock Charts TV. Really excited to bring you some of our favorite commentators Going from 2019 into 2020, we're gonna be talking about some of the themes that were big this last year and some of the themes that they're seeing in the markets and expecting to see more of as we roll into 2020. So I'm really excited to, to bring you this content here. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, first up, we have Arthur Hill, one of my personal favorite commentators. And we all know that technology and software has kind of been leading the end of the, uh, the year here. And specifically, I think Arthur was gonna be talking about cloud computing. Yeah, we got cloud computing coming up from Arthur here. So I'm really excited to hear his thoughts on cloud computing as we go here from 2019 into 2020. Take it away, Arthur. Hey, this is Arthur Hill, Senior Technical Strategist at TrendInvestorPro.com. 2019 was quite the year, and I wanna highlight a big event. And this big event actually occurred twice, in the first half and here in the third quarter. Let's hit the charts. So now I'm gonna move into my deep charting voice. And we're gonna start off, of course, with the XLK, which is a good representative, as good of a representative as any of the technology sector. And we can see here that XLK just had that massive move here into April, and then had another push to new highs in the middle of the year around June. And then there's this third quarter stall that we had where the technology sector moved pretty much sideways in July, August, and September. And here we can see we got the breakout in October and we're getting new highs into year end. So technology led in the first half of the year, slowed down in the third quarter, and then has resumed its advance here in the fourth quarter. It's the biggest sector in the S&P 500, and that's why we need to pay attention to technology. And, you know, it just wasn't a bunch of large cap technology stocks driving the sector. You can see the equal weight version of the technology SBDR has that big surge to new highs in April, a pullback, which is normal after a big surge, and then another push to new highs. And then we get that two to three month stall in the third quarter and then another push to new highs. Now, the semiconductor group was a very good performer in the technology sector. Semiconductors are cyclical, so it's a group that you want to see leading. And there you can see we got the big breakout to a new high and then kind of an ascending triangle in the third quarter. And that was the pause that refreshed and we got another push to new highs in semiconductors. So they uh, actually held up quite well during this third quarter consolidation because they just moved sideways. As we'll see with these next ones, they actually corrected. Now, here's what I mean with this third quarter correction. Software was one of the laggards in the third quarter. And you can see it led. There's a huge move from December all the way up to July. But then we had a pretty good pullback in software. But you got to remember, after this massive advance from 165 to 230, you're entitled to a pullback. And so this was what was lagging in the third quarter. But you can see we got that breakout in October in software, and we got a new high. So uh, the big event here is that software is leading again with a 52-week high. But you know what? It's not just software that has really rallied back. Here is the cloud computing ETF, FDN, also related to the technology sector. Big move and then a correction. And it actually started its correction with that high in April and corrected for quite a few months there. But the other big event is look at that breakout. We're breaking out in the cloud computing ETF and on the verge of hitting a new high. Another group within technology would be cybersecurity. This is the hack ETF. And again, you can see that, you know, it was leading in the first half. It did hit a 52 week high in July, but it got pretty hit pretty hard there in the third quarter. But if you look at it, you have two big steps forward. You have one step backward with basically a 50% retracement of that prior advance. And then we got the breakout and hack actually broke out before software or cloud computing. So it's a leader and that is a 52 week high. Now, the last one I want to show you is the First Trust Internet ETF, and it is lagging the other ones that I just showed within the technology sector. It was leading here with that new high, and it corrected like the rest with around a 50% retracement of the prior advance. 
But where the others started moving higher there in October, November, FDN didn't catch on until the last week of November, and it is breaking out here as we start December. So it's one that could play a little catch up here. So there you have it. Technology has come back in a big way, led by software, internet, and cloud computing. Thanks a lot for tuning in, and have a great day. All right, so next up, we're going to hear from Roman Bogomazov. Now, Roman has these two charts here that we're going to take a look at. I'm really excited to see this comparison between some price history that we saw in the NASDAQ in the late 90s, and then what we've seen in that market more recently. So very excited to hear from Roman. As a Wyckoffian, I now look closely at the price structure and how it unfolds. In 2019, we had two distinct environments. One is the rally of the December lows. That was a momentum rally that had a lot of breadth behind it and suggested that um, we are actually in the reaccumulation pattern. And then an upsloping structure with swings up and down that have created higher highs and higher lows. Um, in itself, it's a trading range. Now, in the uh, uh, beginning of December, we are having a breakout. Well, what's so important about this structure in 2019? Well, one of the most important things um, that we've been observing this whole year, 2019, is that this particular price structure follows uh, very closely a historical analog of NASDAQ composite from uh, 1997 to 2000. Well, before we understand what has happened in 2019 and why this analog is so important, let's go to 2018, 19 um, uh, for the current structure and then to 97, 98 uh, for the historical structure. And we could see that in both cases for NASDAQ composite, the structure has um, had a climactic run that was stopped um, with the buying climax and that was followed by a change of character that increased the volatility a lot and suggested that from now on we're going to be in the trading range we're going to be in the different environment uh, which started with the trading range uh, which had a lot of absorption uh, and in both cases it concluded with the attempt to retest the support in one case more like a spring and the second one a higher low is the last point of support and after this the rally uh, has unfolded in both cases that has uh, overthrown uh, the price above the resistance that was created by the buying climax so so far we could see how closely these two analogs in the price structure are actually um, interacting um, on all of the swings and on all and on all of the highs and the lows well this up thrust overthrow has been followed in both cases with a very uh, distinct decline uh, that had a lot of uh, increase of volatility and had a lot of distributional qualities I remember um, you know trading in 1998 that was the Russian default this is where the mid-cycle uh, Fed uh, lowering rate has happened, and we kind of could see this in 2019 happening again. We'll talk about this um, in the next video. Well, what has happened afterwards, and why are we using this as an analog? Let's quickly look at this. Well, since phase C uh, in uh, 1999 um, in NASDAQ Composite, we could see that we have had a very big rally. It's a momentum rally. It actually overcame the high of the upthrust in 1999. Um, we have a very robust and very momentum uh, type like rally in 2019 as well. Both rallies have lasted for four months. So there is a lot of um, you know um, analog uh, comparisons here also on the time basis. Um, have a quick look at the duration of the trading range from phase A to phase C in both cases, close to 12 months, one year. Um, after the rally, after the momentum rally, we have an upslope in uh, trading range that has been unfolding in 1999 for uh, over nine months. 
and this trading range has it folded as the higher high and higher low. Well, we have somewhat of a similar trading range, upsloping uh, uh, trading range that is unfolding right now, and we are into the seventh, eighth month of this structure. So we're seeing that sometimes a historical analog could be of such great use to us uh, when comparing uh, the past markets and the past price structures to the current price structures. Look what I got here. It's some gold from Greg Schnell. Greg's going to be talking to us about how this all-important market fared in 2019. And as we roll into 2020, he's going to take a look at what gold is going to do on his charts. Take it away, Greg. I think the single most influential chart for 2019 is gold. And the reason I think that is because what we're trying to figure out for gold heading into the, the change of the decade 2020 is whether or not gold is going to start a new bullish up thrust much like it did in 2000 2002 or if it just rolls back over again and uh, and falls apart so a couple of things on this chart make it pretty interesting first of all we have a flat base here that we broke out of that's five or six years long we had the flat base in 1999 through 2001 that we broke out the period all through 89 to 96, we didn't really break out. We had a brief blip and then failed. And then uh, this downsloping trend line back here in 85, 86, we had a two year run in gold and then it was a downtrend for seven years. So I fully understand why lots of people think gold isn't going anywhere. Uh, there is another clue on this chart that I think is relatively important and that clue here is all of these downtrend lines breaking on the CRB on the first two, gold actually topped on that moment, not got going. And on the third one, um, as it broke the trend line, gold got going with it. And so I think that's a pretty important clue. What we have now is we have uh, the CRB breaking this downtrend. And now we're sitting here looking at this horizontal base. And if gold can start to turn here and actually head higher, and if bond yields are, are um, about to change direction, all of these things could add up to marking a major inflection point for gold. The way I'm going to focus on it, you can see all the way through this uptrend here, with the exception of the 08 crisis, gold held the 40 week moving average or the, the 10 month moving average. Looking at my next chart, gold has a big uptrend here all the way through 2010, 11, 12, started to wobble below and couldn't stay above this 40 week moving average. And then it, it stayed below for almost the whole trip down for three years. Now it's oscillated back and forth. And in the 2017, eight period, it pretty much found support there, then dipped below. And so far this 40 week moving average has been support. If gold was to pull back here towards the end of the year, I would expect to see this breakout to the upside. And during this breakout, this could probably mark uh, a, a major inflection point for gold. If it can hold this horizontal line and the, the 40 week moving average on a closing basis, I would be pretty excited. I might even wait for the end of the month to make sure. But if, if that was going to renew a new upstart for gold, uh, then we'd be ready for it heading into 2020 and it could be could mark one of the biggest runs of the century That's my big play. I think bonds were another big choice, but I'm gonna focus on gold this time. Thanks everybody so We've got Dave Keller coming up next now Dave Keller is our chief market strategist here at stock charts And he is gonna be talking about some fascinating things that have been playing out when we look at large caps versus small caps in 2019. We've seen quite the divergence between those two markets. So Dave, let's see what you got. Hey guys, I'm Dave Keller, the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com. I want to share with you my influential moment in the markets in 2019, and it's the underperformance of small caps. Uh, looking at the charts, we've talked a lot uh, on my show, The Final Bar, about uh, you know the relationship between the large and mega cap stocks and the small cap stocks. And in a bull market phase, when the market is doing well, you would expect small cap stocks to uh, outperform, to do well, because that's sort of the juice, that's the offense, that's you know, the more speculative, higher beta risk on type of trade. But if you look at the chart from the December 2019, eight, oh, sorry, 2018 market low, you'll see that actually over that period, so almost over the last year, 
large caps have actually led the way. So the S&P up 35%, mid caps next up 29, almost 30%. Then we have small caps, then we have micro caps up about 22%. So all four of those up, but large mega caps are really leading the way. So as this market has moved that last leg higher coming out of the August, September uh, sort of weaker period, uh, you've seen it, it appears that large caps have done well. Now, if you look at the individual uh, ETF, the IWM, which is the Russell 2000 ETF, you can see leading out of the market low, this is the relative performance of the IWM versus the S&P 500, uh, small caps actually led for the first two months or so, so it made sense. But then look at this relative strength line that just completely goes lower all the way to uh, the first week in September. That's because the IWM was stagnant. It hit resistance around 158 or so and just was never able to get above it. And that's as large cap stocks in the form of the S&P 500 continued the stepwise motion, higher highs, higher lows. If we look now, we can see that the IWM has broken above resistance, now retested it, even as the S&P has gone higher. And the relative strength is sort of stable. The next chart, however, we're going to look at the relative performance, each of these other, or I guess the absolute performance of each of these four ETFs, but on a shorter term time frame. So the S&P 500, if we look back on the last chart, actually bottomed out uh, here at the beginning of August, but small caps, mid caps actually bottomed out at the end of August, that last week in August. So if we start the clock there and look at the performance from that moment on, you can see that actually micro caps have been the best performers since that bottom and small micro and mid cap stocks. Again, a little later than the large cap, up about 12%. Uh, then we have small caps in the IJR, that's the S&P 600 ETF, up 11%. And then we have mid caps, and then we have large caps, which are actually up the least out of the four. So in that shorter term time frame, we actually have seen the small cap outperformance we've been waiting for. But for me going, uh, you know, concluding this year, thinking about where we've been and then starting to think forward into uh, 2020, I think this chart is a really important one to look at, which is the last year on the IWM. This basing pattern for the last eight to 10 months has been significant. We had the rally out of the lows and the outperformance of small caps. Then we just had this stable sort of range bound period. We've now broken above there. And the question on my mind is, do we see a resilience of small caps? Do we see an improvement as it breaks to new highs going into new year? Do we see a, an improvement in the relative strength characteristics? Or do we see this, the large cap, mega cap trade that seems to have worked for so much of 2019 continue into 2020? So that small cap underperformance or the outperformance of large and mega caps, I think was one of the most important factors in the, uh, in the US equity markets in 2019, something I'll certainly be looking for in 2020. Thanks so much. So Aaron Swenlin is going to be talking to us about how the shakeups in international trade really kind of throughout the globe have been affecting markets in 2019 and how that's going to translate as we go into 2020 and what's going to be happening uh, in that new landscape. This is Aaron Swenlin of Decision Point. I would have to say one of the most influential events for 2019 would have to be the US-China trade war. I think that it affected the stock market um, often when it hit the news uh, with President Trump's tweets, et cetera. So I thought it would be interesting to take a walk through some of the major announcements that were related to the trade war and then look at how the market uh, was affected. So let's see, as of the taping, I do have to say uh, that we have a tentative agreement uh, regarding currency safeguards, property theft protection. Apparently, China should be doubling, um, uh, well, we'll be doubling our overall exports to China. Uh, the jury's out politically as to whether this is going to be a success or a failure. No idea whether China will follow through. But since that announcement was made, you can see back here, we have started to see the market um, make a move uh, higher. So let's go ahead and we're going to start back here. So if you recall back in December, on December 1st, both of the parties where we were stuck um, was trying to figure out the cyber intrusion, cyber theft. Um, with, they were negotiating on, on how that would go down. And the Trump administration at that point had said that if the end of 90 days, they couldn't reach an agreement that the 10% tariffs would be raised 
to 25% and that the hard deadline for that was going to be March 1st. Uh, that announcement was right around December 1st and you can see the market didn't take to it too kindly. Of course, uh, you know, there are other factors, of course, that do affect the markets, but we're looking specifically at, at trade war dates. But that came in right here at the top in December of last year. And of course, we really didn't see anything happen until the end of December uh, when Santa Claus finally decided to come a little bit late. So let's move forward now to uh, February. And on February 24th, uh, the administration decided that it would extend that March 1st deadline and uh, not raise the tariff rates until May 10th. Uh, you know, the markets, you know, at that point we were getting a pause, we did see a, a breakdown, but overall we still remained in a rising trend. So on May 8th, uh, the beginning here in May is when the Trump administration gave formal notice of its intent, intent to raise tariffs on $200 billion worth of imports um, for 25% to 10%. And as you can see, at that point when those tariffs hit, we did see a decline in the markets. Uh, but right before the G20 talks, uh, you know, they decided they'd get together and plan to meet at the G20. And they agreed. Um, at that point to, you know, China agreed to some unspecified new purchases of farm products. Um, Trump agreed to no new tariffs, uh, you know, and that sort of thing. So um, by June 29th, we were seeing some uh, improvement here on the G20. And then back here at the beginning of August is when the trade talks started to break down. Um, there wasn't a lot of visible progress. And President Trump at that point said that China had failed to keep their promise to buy those farm products, and he announced 10% tariffs on $300 worth of Chinese imports in addition to the 25% they'd already levied. And you can see that at the beginning of August, we did start to see some choppy trading, um, a big decline on that uh, stall. But uh, all through August, there was there were lots of um, you know, back and forth with China and, and the market really did show a lot of volatility. So on September 20th, there was a two day meeting um, between the US and Chinese deputies. Uh, you know, at the end, China canceled a planned visit to the farming regions uh, that they were supposed to go to, but um, they still, both sides said that it was productive and they agreed to stay uh, to keep talking. Um, but nothing had been agreed to at that point. And you can see that the markets did start to fail a little bit there at the end of September. So now we're gonna move forward and we get a phase one agreement is what we were told. And that happened uh, October 10th and uh, after two days of talks. And so we held off on our escalations uh, as far as rates and uh, the Chinese agreed that they would um, start enforcing the intellectual property rules and, and that sort of thing. And so we did start to see a nice move to the upside after that uh, agreements were made. And then um, at the end of November, that's when we, we started to see the next deadline that was coming up for more uh, tariffs to be applied on December 15th. And at that point, uh, the Trump administration in China, apparently they, they got together. Uh, we did get a deal that was struck. Uh, like I said, we still don't know exactly whether that is going to be good or bad uh, in the, the grand scheme of things. But at this point, we did get a market low and we are seeing prices rise. And just to finish the conversation, I have a global chart. I just wanted you to note that we have a, a bear market still in China. They have not managed to break that declining trend of their bear market. And you can see most of the other uh, others in, on the, around the globe have, including uh, the UK, which hadn't for quite some time, but at the end of this year finally did. So, uh, you know, I don't know who's, whose markets were hurt more by the trade war, but uh, just looking at the price charts, uh, we did see those fluctuations throughout the year and now China is trying to beat out that bear market. Okay, I just got this, this chart here from my friend Bruce. I'm excited to hear his take on the market. He's gonna be looking at turning points, specifically going back in time, comparing some of the, the previous price history that we've seen to today. Really excited to hear from Bruce here. Take it away, Bruce. 
Welcome to Power Charting. This is the 2019 review, which will uh, be a brief look back at 2019. So the first thing we're going to do is have a look at the structure that we've been in. And this review may sound familiar because it's pretty similar to the one that we did back at the end of 2018. And so you can see here that there was a tremendous climactic surge in 2018 into the highs right here. And this climactic surge set up a condition that in Wyckoff we call a range bound market. And this is a range bound market that is defined by the buying climax and the automatic reaction. So this all occurred in January, February of 2018. And you can see that thereafter, the market really did remain largely bound by this range bound condition. And so when we look back at the end of 2018, we said that this range bound condition would continue. We actually said this at the beginning of 2018 also, and that it would continue for a period of time into 2019. And that is exactly what has happened. We said back in May, June of 2019 that there was a backup or a last point of support that occurred that pulled back into the top part of this reaccumulation condition and that this would be uh, the beginning of an important uh, rally up and out. So we're starting to see the market commit upward, but something important happened in the middle here and that is, is that there was a tremendous sell-off from October 2018 into the end of December. And this produced a uh, rally that was a very important rally because you can see that there was huge demand uh, that occurred all the way up into this area over 3,000 on the S&P. And this very important rally shows that there was stock in strong hands. And this is really what prevented the market from being able to pull back into the trading range more deeply as it completed a reaccumulation structure. Now let's change gears here uh, now that we've looked at that because back in the end of June, the end of the second or the second quarter, first half of the year, uh, I did this on, chart on the third turning. And so we can see that there has been in this bull market three reaccumulation structures that have occurred since 2009. Currently, we are completing the third one. At the time that I wrote this, there was 18 months of reaccumulation going back to the beginning of 2018 and that buying climax, which we just talked about. And this range bound condition literally is the pause or the refresh, which allows the market to get back in gear and begin a new uptrend, which is exactly what happened in the uh, preceding two reaccumulations. So this is very exciting. You can see this upward uh, trend line over the market here, and it was hovering right at the end of June. So this now is not 18 months because it was done in July. It's now tw uh, 21 months, just like the prior two, almost exactly the same amount of time that has occurred. And now the market is beginning to commit into a new uptrend. And we look at 2020 going forward, we're going to be considering what is the likely uh, trajectory of the market in 2020 based on the third turning, based on the prior structure that goes all the way back to the beginning of 2018. So look for that looking ahead to 2020. Thanks for being here. So we have Julius de Kempinar up next, and Julius is gonna to talk to us about some of the strength that we've seen out of the consumer staple sector here at the end of 2019. So we've got our bull market over here, we've got our consumer staple stocks over here. Let's see how those come together. Hello, sector watchers. As they say, tis the season, or in this case, tis time to look back. 
For this occasion, I would like to take the opportunity to look back at some of my own work and share an important lesson that I once again learned this year. As a matter of fact, it's not so much something that I learned, but more being confronted with something that you already know, but tend to forget until Mr. Market once again kicks in an open door. I am referring to two, or actually three, maybe four articles that I wrote in the RRG blog last year. The first one is dated the 8th of May, and it was titled, The S&P Executes Wedge and Rotation to Defensive Sectors Accelerates. It's a few days after the S&P tested overhead resistance near 2950 and subsequently broke more or less a textbook wedge pattern in downward direction. The index was at 2885 at the time. If we look at what happened to the S&P after that failed test and the break out of that wedge, we can see that the resulting move pretty much completed um, a textbook decline back to the start of the pattern around 27.25. So far, so good. Then on the 5th of June, I wrote an article titled Staples and Financials Head Towards the Leading Quadrant While Energy Rolls Back Into Lagging. Now, there was nothing wrong with that observation, especially the staples sector continued higher well into the leading quadrant in the weeks following that post. What did not work out so well was my emphasized quote saying that is a positive for XLP, but as staples is one of the more notorious defensive sectors, it may not be the best news for the S&P 500. And although that may generally be true, I'm afraid I was too focused on seeing the S&P drop even further, and I wanted the relative strength of the staple sector to confirm that view. Now, when defensive sectors are outperforming, that's bad for the market, i.e. the S&P 500, right? Well, no, not always as it turned out. The rally of the S&P out of that 27.25 low was driven by staples and other traditionally defensive sectors, and in July, we were back above the 2950 barrier. No weakness in the S&P at all. A typical case of you nailed it and then you failed it. Luckily enough, the July 29 block, the break to new highs in the S&P 500 is now getting support from rotation to offensive sectors put me back on track. Um, my own takeaway for this sequence of events was to once again do some research into offensive versus defensive sectors and their rotation. And instead of following traditionally and generally accepted qualifications, trying to get some quantification of these events and rotational patterns. Now that led to my October 17 article titled Measuring Offensive versus Defensive Sectors Using Beta. And one of the main takeaways in that article is that a rotation to staples and other defensive sectors that does not necessarily mean weakness for the market as a whole. Not always, at least. As a result, my biggest lesson of 2019, reviewed, relearned, once again pushed into my face by Mr. Market, is focus on what you're actually observing, not what you want to see or what you think you should see. I wish all of you a very happy holiday season. A good and healthy start of the new year, and I hope to see you all back again in 2020, either as readers of the RRG blog or as watchers of Sector Spotlight. Even better, both. All right, what do we got here? Ah, Tom Boley. Tom is going to be talking to us about how Fed policy affected markets in 2019. Really excited to hear Tom's thoughts on the Fed. Tom, let's hear it. Okay, as I look back at 2019, I recognize that probably uh, most folks looking at the stock market would assume that the trade war was the big headline for the year and the big story. Um, I would argue that though, I actually think it was the Fed and I think the Fed made a number of missteps. And so I'd like to explain why I think they made missteps and how it impacted the stock market uh, throughout 2019. As we were getting ready to head into 2019, you can see that this is the S&P 500 dropping in the fourth quarter of 2018. And it was a pretty significant drop, about 20%. And when you look across the top here, this is about these dot, blue dotted lines are pointing out about when these various GDPs were announced. So the quarter one GDP came in 2.5%, quarter two GDP 
three and a half percent. Of course, this is back in 2018. And then the third quarter GDP had slipped back to 2.9%. And as we started falling here, you can also see the 10 year treasury yield taking a tumble at the same time. So as we were heading into this Fed announcement in December, the, both the stock and the bond market, in my opinion, were telling the Fed that things are slowing down. And no doubt, a lot of it had to do with the trade war. So I think that was uh, um, you know, a big part of the problem but it was a temporary problem. And so knowing that the bond market was, sig was signaling the slowdown, knowing that inflation was not a problem, I think it was time back in December for the Fed to lower rates. And instead, they raised rates and they suggested that there would be two more hikes in 2019. And when they made that announcement, the S&P 500 was over 25.50 and within a week tumbled to 2350. So another 200 points on the heels of the Fed mistake. And I know looking back, we can call it a mistake, but it really was a mistake. And I wrote about this a year ago in my Trading Places blog. There should have been no rate hikes and I did not think there would be any in 2019. Now let's fast forward. So now we're moving into the first quarter and into the second quarter of 2019. We did get the report in late January, that fourth quarter GDP had in fact slowed 1.1%. So it wasn't recessionary, we didn't go negative, but that was a pretty steep drop from what we had seen. So the message that was being sent to the Fed was that things were slowing down, we need a rate cut, cut. we didn't get one. Now the S&P 500 rebounded off of those lows. And I think looking back, the stock market was expecting, and you can see the bond market, the 10 year treasury yield kept dropping. So I think what the market was saying is, okay, the Fed's going to come around and they're going to begin to see our side of the story. We're going to have a nice growth period with low in interest rates. And instead, on May 1st, the Fed said, we're going to keep rates steady for an extended period. No need to cut rates. Lower inflation is transitory. Obviously, they didn't pay attention to the dollar rising and commodity prices falling for the last eight years uh, because they were not transitory. After that announcement, May 1st, look what happened. Down for the next month, a huge drop, another 200 points uh, after the Fed announcement. Then we get to July, and after announcing in May that rates were going to stay steady for an extended period, the Fed cut rates, said it was a mid-cycle adjustment and no further rate cut was, was needed for an extended period. Well, the next two meetings, they cut again. So when I look back at the year, I see, I see a market that wants to go higher because of increasing growth, but I also see a market that expected rates to remain low because of no inflation worries whatsoever. And the Fed, it took the Fed throughout much of the year to finally get around to that point where the market was saying they should have been all along. So inevitably, the market had it right. We ended up going higher, setting new all-time highs. But in my opinion, it was a big stumble trying to get there because of a Fed that was a big roadblock. So to me, when I look back to 2019, the big story really was the Fed. It wasn't the trade war. So closing us out here on our year end wrap is going to be Dave Landry. Now, Dave Landry is a true trader through and through. So he's going to be talking to us about what he's doing in 2020 to stick to his trading routines, keep himself honest and make sure that he's really executing his system uh, as best that he can. So I'm going to jump off here. I'm going to figure out how to turn this thing off and we're going to cut over to Dave. Is it here? Off? No, wait. Oh, here it is. Off. <laughs> Hello everyone, Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is the 2019 year in review. When my producer over at StockCharts.com asked me to do a year in review, I wasn't really sure what she was looking for. So I asked her and she said, well, just give us a few minutes about what's changed in the markets and how you changed your approach based on how the markets changed. Just something that our viewers could benefit from. And I got to thinking about it, it's like, do I really need to do a video because nothing's really changed. Going back about a year ago, I was invited to be the guest of honor at Charlie Kirk's Traders Retreat, and I was very humbled and excited to go, big fan of Charlie Kirk. And one of the participants there, Charlie's in the white shirt, and Mike Peterson is in the red shirt. Mike Peterson 
approached me and said, Dave, you know, I wasn't sure who you were before the retreat. So a few weeks back, I looked you up on Google and I noticed in a forum about 20 years ago, you were saying the same thing that you're saying now. You're saying use stops, take partial profits. You're trading the same pattern such as the TKO and so on and so forth. And then he went on to say how that was in stark contrast to these system of the month guys out there that are always telling you they have this great thing. And if you just give them a bunch of money, they're going to show it to you in next week or whenever. And then he went on to say, it kind of begs the question, well, what about the thing that they were selling last month? Are they no longer using that? Anyway, long story endless. It was a wonderful compliment to me to know that somebody noticed that I've been consistent throughout the year. So as far as a year in review, it's a lot like the prior years as far as my approach, with, except I made one little tweak or two, and I'll talk about those towards the end. But for the most part, it was a year to remain consistent. It was a year to remain patient. It was a year to remain flexible. And it was a year of trading where the action is until it isn't. And then it was also a year to be disciplined, especially a year to be disciplined. So let's break that down. Let's take a look at what happened in the S&P 500. We had a really good trend coming into the year, and then we had a pretty serious sell-off, and then the market worked its way higher. We had a little bit of a sell-off, another sell-off, and then a very nice trend, which so far we're still in. Now, I mostly played the long side when the overall market was headed higher via individual stock issues, and then I played the short side when the market was headed lower. And... Even though the market has been going pretty much straight up lately, we still have two shorts that are still working in the open portfolio. Now, the reason I short is not quite the most obvious one, which I do short because it's the only way to make money if the market goes down. But the other reason I short is a little less obvious. My friends who run hundreds of millions of dollars and are long only oriented when the market gets a little iffy, they tend to see the market more as glass half full at worst as opposed to half empty. And the shorts really help you to see both sides of the market. You're not going to get rich on the short side, but being able to short is very important to help you see both sides of the market. And let's say things are getting a little iffy, you're seeing a lot of short setting up, you might just pull in your horns a little bit and not buy as many stocks as you initially wanted to. So it's a great thing to do. And I think 2019, even though we ended up much higher or should end up much higher than we started, it was bumpy along the way. Also, the other thing we had in 2019, it was a year to be patient. And if you look at that chart, if you look at the beginning to the end, it's like, oh, well, the market went up quite a bit. But throughout the middle of the year, it was sideways and choppy. And there were days and sometimes even weeks where I couldn't find a setup to save my life. And so you know what I did? I sat on my hands. So it was definitely a year of patience. If you look and at the current portfolio, you'll see right now we don't have any setups and we haven't had a setup in about a week. And I'm going to keep showing no setups until we find something that's worth trading. Now, I did a crypto show recently for StockCharts.com, which you can find on YouTube for Crypto Week. And if you take a look at Bitcoin, it was like any other market. There were some really good times to trade it. I took all my trades for the year, and I've got them marked up on this chart here. And notice that after June or mid-July, I really hadn't made any new trades. So I've been out of that market for five or six months. And I'm going to continue to stay out of the Bitcoin market until and unless it begins to trend again and sets up. And you should treat any other market like that. Now, as I said, a lot of times there's nothing to do. You go back about two weeks in my trading service. And on the 13th, there wasn't anything to trade. On the 14th, there was nothing to trade. On the 15th, there was nothing to trade. And then on the 18th and 19th and then 20th and then 21st. And then on the 22nd, there still wasn't anything. Except at the close of the 22nd, when I was doing my analysis... I came across a stock called KOD. So I waited and I waited and I waited. And believe me, it's hard to wait. It's hard to be patient. But if you wait, good things will come. 
So here's KOD. It sets up on that Friday after the close as a TKO, which you may recognize from my prior trading simplified shows. And then on Monday, this is Thanksgiving week, it didn't trigger. On Tuesday, it didn't trigger. On Wednesday, it didn't trigger. On Thursday, well, it was Thanksgiving, the market was closed. But then on Friday, it went all day or nearly all day. And then finally, right around the close, the stock triggers. Most people gave up. Yeah, it didn't trigger all week. Why bother with it? They went off to be with their families and forgot about the stock. Now, let's take a look at what happened. On Monday, it rallies over 200%. So not only do you have to be patient to wait for setups like every other year, you also had to be patient once you have a setup. Now here's a bit of an extreme example, and this is one truth be told that I nearly missed. It was a stock I recommended as a buy. It was a TKO, also kind of a bow tie, first thrust type of pattern. And the next day it didn't trigger. The next day it didn't trigger. The next day it didn't trigger. It went eight days, and for eight days I placed my orders to get into stock. On the ninth day, I figured, well, it's not going to trigger. If it doesn't trigger soon, it's probably no longer to be set up, so why bother? Well, I received a notice pop up from my Facebook group that somebody was talking about one of my stocks I just triggered. So I clicked on it and I realized it was this stock here, R your HN. So I ran to my trading computer or walked. It was right <laughs> it's pretty close to where my other computers are. So I walked over and place to trade and luckily I got in a fairly with a fairly decent fill. I lost a few cents on the fill and then the stock rallied 60% in one day. So that was a stock that I could have missed just by not being disciplined and by not being patient and placing those orders day after day. Now along the lines of being disciplined, it was a year where there were quite a few IPOs that were worth trading but in many cases, one such as this TIGR, it triggered, ran up nicely, but then came right back in. And this is where the money management comes into play. The stock triggers, rallies up to initial profit target. I took partial profits in this particular case and trailed the stop higher for better than the Pokemon and I trade. Now, this is a stock that I talked about in the Facebook group before it triggered. And unfortunately, some people, they wrote it up, but then they wrote it all the way down. So again... 2019, like every other year, was a year to be disciplined. 2019 was a year of trading IPOs, and I was going through my trading records, and I've got at least a dozen of them, and many of them look like that TIGR trade. They ran up and came right back in, but that's okay. It's a pattern I call the fly and the die. You can make a lot of money during that fly phase, but it does require a lot of money management. So 2019 was a year of trading IPOs until it wasn't. I haven't seen that many IPOs worth trading lately, but I'm still looking. It was a year of trading Bitcoin, as you saw earlier, until it wasn't. I haven't, as I said earlier, had a Bitcoin trade in about six months. It was a year of shorting big cap stocks. We shorted some big cap stocks late in the year until it wasn't, well, question mark. We still have a couple of big cap stocks that are in the portfolio. And it was also a year of trading biotech, gold, and shippers, and also insurance companies. And I didn't even realize this was an insurance company when it set up and I bought it. So these stocks right now are working out pretty nicely, but when they stop out, they stop out. So it's going to be the remainder year is going to be a year of trading the biotechs, the golds, the shippers, and the insurance companies until it isn't. Now, Getting back to the what's changed with you, and I initially couldn't think of anything, but then I got to thinking something has changed with me. And I think that if you want to make a big change in your trading in 2020, what you need to do is make a small change. And I've been writing about this quite a bit lately at DaveLander.com, but one of the small changes that I made was to write a little card and use it as a bookmark in my trading journal. And the card says, I, Dave Landry, will take the best ogre trades, those are opening gap reversals, and trend trades, even if this means passing on okay opportunities and watching them occasionally take off without me. Now, if you try to make a big change, your body is going 
to resist. In fact, let me just show you my little brains here. We have this primal part of our brain that keeps us alive. And this is something I'm going to talk a lot about in coming shows on Trading Simplified and on DaveLander.com. And it's quick to react. It's very emotional. But doing something as simple as reading a little card, it only takes a few seconds to get past this part of your brain to get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there. So reading this little card, believe it or not, has kept me out of a tremendous amount of trouble. So it is one small change that I would encourage you to make is just tell yourself, look, I'm going to read this card before every trade to make sure, and make it your own, obviously, but to make sure you're taking the best of the best opportunities. So I'm joined here by a special guest. This is my wife, Marcy. Over the years, I've told a lot of Marcy stories, and the reason is because through osmosis, she's learned a lot about trading. And just last week, for instance, I was long Peloton. I go in the house for lunch. She says, how's it going? I said, well, that remember, I got long Peloton yesterday. She's like, yeah. I said, well, it's up nicely, so it's going well. And then later in the day, she says, how's it going? I was like, ah, oh, not so good. That Peloton has turned around, and now it's going lower. And then she says, well, were you supposed to sell it while I was up? And I'm like, no. And she's like, well, what's the problem? So anyway, she's helped me out throughout the years, so I'm very thankful to have her. Marcy, you want to tell anybody, everybody anything? Or? I just want to wish everyone a very happy holiday, and thanks for watching. Yeah, happy holidays. Thanks for watching.